All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to one of the Hall of Fame sessions for uh, for the spring or the summer, I, I guess you wish. And uh, my name is Eric Rosenfeld. I'm the program director for Digital Art and Design and Graphic Design. And with me, I'm very happy to have with me here Juan Peralta from uh, um, out in L.A., correct? Or outside of L.A. Um, yeah. And uh, from a company you might have heard of, uh, such as Psych Skywalker Sound and a graduate of the Recording Arts degree, correct? Yes. And then 1999. Uh, 1999. Well, OK, just a, just a while ago, a couple hair colors ago, maybe. Oh, no, sorry. 96. 96 oh, 96. Sorry. OK, very important. <laughs> and um, as well as Nathaniel Howe, who's uh, a computer animation graduate from some time ago as well, you know, a while. And uh, <laughs> who is in um, uh, Beverly Hills, correct? That's correct. Yes. Located and making sure I'm right here uh, in his own studio named Nathaniel Howe. And um, this session, uh, we are calling How to Be a Remote Creative Professional. This is something that, you know, has been part of our industry for a while is how to do remote work. But obviously, during COVID and the pandemic, um, it's something we've had to do a lot more of. So we have sort of two different stories here regarding um, how people interact, manage, and deal with creative professionals remotely. And so um, if it's okay, I'm going to step aside for a moment and I'll I'll let Juan and Nathaniel uh, kind of introduce themselves, and then mm -hmm. I will um, I will uh, be looking at the question and answer column or a panel. So if you have questions for them while they're while they're talking, don't hesitate to use the uh, the Q and A panel, and I will then interject some of those questions mm -hmm. during the session, and um, we'll try to get to everybody's uh, questions along the way. So uh, welcome, Nathaniel and Juan. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Nate, you want to go first? Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Nate Howe, and uh, you know I'm really passionate about design and motion graphics. Uh, I freelanced for a very long time for a lot of different studios in LA and New York, and got to work internationally with some in Italy and uh, a few other places, and uh, started my own studio about 10 years ago, uh, bought out my business partner about six years ago or something like that, and just been jamming and doing my thing. Uh, you know, we do a lot of broadcast design, a lot of motion graphics, uh, style frames. And uh, yeah, I'm really passionate about running a small business and selling creativity. So grateful to be here. Cool. Uh, my name is Juan Peralta. Like I said earlier, I graduated a uh, recording arts program in 1996. Uh, moved out to LA in that same year. And I uh, started working in audio post-production um, as a mixed technician. Basically, um, you know, just making sure everything regarding the mix is working properly from speakers to projectors to console automation to all the audio equipment, everything. Um, I love my job and I've been doing it ever since. Um, I moved up to the mixing position probably about, oh gosh, about 10 years ago now. So I've been mixing now. Uh, sound effects mostly uh, for uh, a lot of the Marvel movies and um, all kinds of different projects throughout the years. Um, been at Skywalker Sound since two, no, 1999. So been there over 20 years now. And um, like I said, love my job. It's every movie is different and you work with a bunch of different people. I learn things every day and uh, just keep doing my thing. All right. So um, if we are, you know, the, the topic is, you know, um, being and dealing with remote creatives, um, as I was wondering, I was just curious, as we're, you know, slowly coming out of our sort of pandemic and quarantine year, um, maybe we start off the bat is just how did that affect what you do? And, um, and, you know, what do you what do you kind of feel like is going to maybe stick around post pandemic? Yeah, so when the pandemic hit, I was actually working in LA uh, on the Disney lot, and uh, we were kind of halfway through Black Widow. And um, so the LA school district shut down, and basically the studio was like, everyone go home. And so that's what we did. We ended up getting on a plane, flying home, being with our family. And so we ended up stopping kind of halfway through the project. Um, 
because we were working at Skywalker Sound and uh, the Disney lot is also controlled as a controlled entry, um, Disney would allowed us to come back two months later. So I think that was March. March is when it hit and we closed down. So May, we were able to start back up at Skywalker with a very skeleton crew uh, to continue mixing. And uh, the creatives were all in Los Angeles via Zoom or via Google Meet, we set up cameras. And um, the mixing stage that we were supposed to mix down there was empty, obviously. So we were able to pipe down to them um, video and audio, Atmos um, 9.1 audio um, from our stage at Skywalker. And uh, there's only two mixers. It was me and Laura Hirschberg. And so we figured out, we rigged the system that whenever we hit play, it would mute all microphones so that they could hear the mix down in the mix room down there. And we would hear our mix in the room we were in. And when we would stop, all mics would open. And then the creatives could kind of ask us to do change a couple things here and make that louder, make that softer, then bring the music up or whatever. And then we would get those notes and go back again. And it, to be honest, it worked way better than I thought it was ever gonna work. And I can see that remote mixing style. If a client, let's say, for example, is in London or Paris or Australia, I can see that actually working. I mean, barring the time differences and stuff, that would be harder, but, um, because it works so flawlessly, I can see that happening in the future, you know, for any given reason. That's awesome. On our end, it was uh, a big jump. I mean, we had always worked with artists that were, you know, I have uh, a lot of artists that I work with in London and other places. So they're always been re remote with me, but it was different to have my core guys that are usually here, not here. Uh, and they're still not here. I'm, I'm in the office but no one else is working in the office, everyone's home. Uh, and that was a lot different because it really shined the spotlight on how many micro touch points there are throughout a day, uh, getting up to get a cup of coffee or you know, walking by somebody's screen and seeing how they're interpreting a creative challenge and then you know, uh, uh, having just a small conversation about that or slightly altering something I'm doing or asking them a question that I wouldn't even know to ask because I couldn't see what they were doing when they were remote. All those micro touch points are less organic now. And that's a negative for sure. Uh, so I try to facilitate conversation. And what's hard is with the creative conversation, you want it to be organic and you want it to flow and you want the conversations to bubble up and emerge as as they would organically when you notice something or think of something. So it's hard to say like, okay, we're gonna schedule a time for you guys to be inspired by one another at 11 to 11.30 today. You know, So <laughs> I find what it is is a lot of just getting on, sharing screens, talking about what you're doing and just uh, trying to keep it casual and not trying to set an expectation that there's some grand result from it. But granted, there's a time where we have to really nail a pitch or, or you know, get the idea locked down. Uh, but so I try and have more communication with that. The other thing that changed a lot was, which I think is way for the better, and I hope it stays, is with my clients, we would always have these phone calls in, in the past. And, and we'd be talking about visual arts and visual campaigns. But we'd always be on a phone and it would be like, you know, be cutting out a little bit and they wouldn't have the, the presentation open or they'd be on the wrong page. And now everything with video chat is so much better. And I also think there's been an explosion of, productivity tools, you know, things like Loom. I use Loom every day to be able to share my screen, mark up on it, talk about things. The second I hit stop, that video already has a link copied to my clipboard and I can paste it in a chat, in an email to anybody. So I use that throughout the day a lot to communicate with my team and with my clients. Uh, so I think some of those things have, you know, really improved. Uh, and I think it makes you get more focused on what you're going to say to your artists, say to your clients, things like that, because the communication, it, it's more challenging now. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time for sure. There's pros and cons to, from the work side. 
The um, if we're talking about sort of uh, communication tools, you mentioned Loom already. Are there sort of common tools that you find you're using every day? Um, is email still a primary communication tool or have your teams moved beyond um, email or texting um, in, with your tool set? It's, you know, we're working with Paramount Plus right now on a new Star Trek uh, show that's going to be coming out. We're doing all the creative for the marketing on it. And uh, they have a very large team and they have a lot of people touching this property and a lot of people from the show creators to the Paramount Plus executives to some of the old CBS executives that have now merged. And that client really likes to use Slack a lot. And I know Slack is very popular. I personally don't like Slack because I don't like coming into work in the morning and I'm like, all right, let me check my email. And it's like, okay, now let me go check my Slack. I just want to check one thing. So uh, we had a conversation with that client because they wanted us to start using Slack, but that's not organic to our workflow at our studio. So um, I just basically sat down with, with the executive that we're, you know, who's our main client. And I said, you know, if you want us to use Slack for you guys, for your sake, we will use it. But for us, we don't prefer to work that way. We have our own way that we communicate. Uh, and for us, it's email and then hopping on video chats. I mean, I use Google Meets just because we're, we're in the Google uh, Apps for Work suite here. Um, and we, we jump on video chats, my team and I, like every five minutes sometimes. And some days we just leave it on in the background and we're talking as we're figuring something out as if you were still in the room with me. So I am just, I'm more about video. I'm more about seeing people. I'm about the nuance of communication. I'm about seeing somebody's body language as they're saying something to me. Uh, because those are the ways that like when we're solving complex or abstract creative challenges, that nuance of communication is important. And I don't like a Slack message that can be worded in a way that somebody bangs it out quickly and you can interpret it 35 different ways. On a video chat, we can pop up a screen, share it, draw on it, and clarify and make something tangible. Yeah. The, uh, go ahead, Juan. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree almost completely because um, Skywalker moved to Slack probably like two or three years ago. So we have been using that as our main, and email has been slowly declining. So fortunately, we only deal with kind of one communication line. So in that aspect, it's okay. But um, you know, when you're working in audio and you're listening to things or building a mix where you're kind of like, you know, it, you can't really do it. You got to listen to it. You got to hear it. And um, one thing we have done, which is um, it's okay, but it's not the best thing, is that we will make uh, bounces, mix bounces with in, within Pro Tools with video to send to the clients and stuff so they can listen to it. But we don't know how they're listening to it. We're mixing in Atmos. They're listening in stereo. You know, it, it, you, there's a big kind of clash there with, with that remote um, workflow. So um, the best way to do it is if they're in the room or if they're in a proper listening environment and we can stream to them, that's kind of the best way to do mm -hmm. it. Now, with regards to a, you know, a, stu a student or a fresh graduate who is going to start interacting you know, with people like you on through video, are I'm curious if there's any um, sort of uh, tendencies um, regard that you know things that you feel like how, that work or don't work or will tend to 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 upset a uh, a manager on how you're how you're interacting you know through a video chat. This could be for an interview. It could be for a creative session or a scrum or or whatever it's. Uh, however it's being called with regards to your work um so if, like for example is it are is it expected to have your video camera on right during these sessions or are you just sharing your screens or or um you know how how what level how can how can a graduate show professionalism through a through a video chat with a with a manager i, I think i think there's a lot of different layers to this question but i think a few mm -hmm. important things is that that this time in the world and communication through video, it gives a new hire and a new grad the opportunity to stand out from the competition and separate themselves from other people. Because a lot of people won't have their video camera on or they won't be paying attention. Or if they have to do a, a Loom video, for instance, they'll make it 
17 minutes long when they just need to say three things. So the clarity and the focus of your communication and being sharp. And a lot of people, maybe their, their background, it's like still the messiness of their everyday home life is spilling into it, being professional on the camera, standing out, letting them know that, look, you're not on your home clock right now. You're on the company's clock right now. And like being attentive to that and being easily available and, and reliable in terms of being like able to be reached. Like I just fired a producer. He was making a good rate with me. He was very expensive per day. But like every time I wanted to talk to him, there was always some reason he couldn't get on camera. And it was driving me insane. Like I just needed to, I'm paying you because when I need something, I need you there with me as my right-hand person to, to knock something out. And so what I look for is I look for people that are ready to jump, ready to speak as if they're in the room with me. And, and I think you have to, you have to really take this weird time we're in and find the advantage in it. You have to find a way to stand out from the other people and be sharper and more focused and more professional. So, and, and as a new hire and things like that, it's hard because you're missing out on a lot of like water cooler talk like things that would get you in the culture, things that would make you stand out, things where you get to be yourself and other people start to become friends or allies with you. And then you start to make a name for yourself at a company and fit in and, and find your way. All those things are less organic and more difficult now. And uh, uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complex topic. There's a lot of layers to it. Yeah, I, I agree with that, especially with the... Um with the sharp responses, like if you're a new hire and you're still learning the job, um, you don't want to like extend the meeting or, you know, drag something out when it doesn't need to be that, you know, we're, when I'm mixing, we're on the clock and they're paying really, you know, a lot of money to, to, to mix for these nine hour days. And we need concise, quick uh, responses and um, no, you know, nothing off topic, basically. So as a new hire, you kind of want to be, um, um, yes, I got it. I will go get that, do it. You know, if you have a question, you maybe you can ask it offline afterwards. But when you're on the call, when you're on the video, you're short, you're precise, you get to the point. Any other extraneous questions, you, you sideline that. You do a Slack message, you do something else like that. And then you continue, then you bring it back and say, okay, I did it. Here it is. There it is. Okay, bye. You know, and, and, and that kind of interaction when the clients are in the room or when the clients are on the screen, it's like, wow, these guys got it together. They're like, he asked him, boom, he comes back, he delivers. And the, so that's kind of what you're looking for. You're looking for somebody who's just, you know, and, and, and also paying attention to what we're talking about. Don't ask a, a random question that you, has nothing to do with what we're talking about. So yeah. that kind of stuff. That's what you just said one is so true too. Like, and I think when you're new, you don't have maybe the situational awareness because mm -hmm. in your mind, you're shining the spotlight on yourself so much. You, have, you might have some nerves about being there. You might have a lot of confusion about what you should be doing. Like, you know, there's a lot going on in your own head. And I often find new hires, new grads, they'll say something so out of left field and it really is a distraction for the meeting. And that in front of a client on a Zoom or at the wrong time when people are in a rush on a deadline or stressed or something's not working and you jump in trying to, trying to have the water cooler moment or make a joke or something like, that is kryptonite. You don't wanna mess with that you know, because you just shine the light on yourself and solidified in, in the mind of a lot of people that maybe you shouldn't be on the calls with the clients and things like that. So when in doubt, it's better to kind of just be brief, buttoned up, really kind of almost an order taker on those calls of like, got it. You said this, I'm going to do this, this, this. I'll follow up if I have any questions or, you know, give you an update yeah. once I'm underway. And then just, exactly. it, and just be like soup, you know, less is more for sure. Especially right. when there's more people on the call. Exactly. And I, I imagine, um, you know, being anticipating and being prepared for those meetings is even more important because you don't want to, be um, you want to have those answers on hand as opposed to be searching for those answers and having to fill time as you're trying to figure out the, a, a proper response. And I also imagine that, um, you know, 
it, we've gotten well past the time of video messaging effects like Zoom backgrounds and playing. You know, those jokes got really old very fast yeah. at, oh, the yeah. start, at the start <laughs> of the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> um, uh, we have a question actually from uh, Juan Lentino who um, asks, um, I get um, this question is for both Juan and Nate. Did you set up a mobile studio at your home or could you go into the office um, during the pandemic? You kind of uh, answered that at the beginning, but did you have sort of a remote option for to do some of your work? Um, the only thing I have is I have a laptop that Skywalker gave me with Pro Tools on it. I can open sessions, listen to certain sound effects and review a couple things, but that's about it. Um, my work is so connected to a giant console and a big dubbing stage uh, with, you know, projectors and, you know, speakers everywhere, especially Atmos nowadays, it's kind of impossible to do that kind of stuff. But um, with the uh, with my laptop and the Pro Tools, I, I access like some sound effects editors would send me a session, say, hey, can you listen to this? What do you think? Do you like this? Do you not like that? And I can kind of give them some notes that way. But uh, as far as work work goes, we were fortunate enough that Disney let us go on to Skywalker Ranch because it's so remote and, and the building is massive and the, we can keep the numbers down. We were able to go into work. Yeah. So. On, on my end, you know, it's interesting, like uh, this, this is my office. I can come in. No one else is here, you know, during the pandemic. So for a while I was working from home, but what I realized is what I really need to do is to be able to be inspired and to be able to have kind of sacred space to be able to think about a creative challenge and focus. And I had a hard time doing that at home. I have two little kids. I have a dog. I have two dogs. Uh, my wife, you know, walks in and just starts talking about something to me. And I'm like in the middle of trying to think about something. And I realized it's not conducive. And, and not everyone has the luxury of being able to come into their own office or into an office. But I think it, it highlights a really important point of remote work is that you need to have a way to separate your home life and, and step into a different light when you're in the office. You know what I mean? Like you need to be able to step into your professional role and you need to have a space and a mental you know, framework of that time where it's like, I'm on the clock now. I'm a professional now. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm not blurring that line of home. And I, I feel like part of it is like dressing up, still like being ready for work as if you were going to go. And I, you know, I feel like uh, uh, even being a remote student, you probably would feel it like if you're doing some class from your apartment, that's a much different feeling than walking in the halls of Full Sail. And it's like such a beautiful place there. And you're inspired and you're seeing like, you know, Oscars in the windows and, and you're seeing like other students and VIP guests driving by and like all this you know, all the buzz of being at Full Sail is so exciting. And you forget a lot of intangible, small, unconscious thoughts when you're just at home working. When you're at Full Sail, you're walking around, you're inspired, you're standing up different, your body language might be different, you're noticing more things, you're absorbing things you wouldn't have. So you have to really actively monitor your home space, your mental state, know when to take a break, know when you're blurring in that home life too much, and know when you need to really kind of re-inspire yourself to aim for a higher pedigree of performance or focus. So for me, I come in every day because I need to be able to think, I need to be able to have quiet, I need to be able to be professional mode, you know, not dad mode or whatever. So that's why I come in. And I, you know, it, it's probably good to, to recognize the difference between having, you know, your laptop at home and your professional workstation. Right. Or even I imagine you, there might have been a little scramble where you might have had some artists that didn't have the equipment at home to continue um, what they were doing in the studio. How did you sort of overcome that? Yeah, that's that was big. I mean, a lot of the people, you know, they're like, oh, wait, my version of cinema at home is different or I don't have this plug that you guys have at the office, stuff like that. So, I mean, all those all those IT things were a little bit of a pain. But we streamlined it. We, we figured it out. We got it done. A lot of the big stuff now is like making sure that artists properly back up their work and the security of the work. You know, those are the things that I worry about that other people that work for me don't worry about so much. And I, I always try and make them worry about it because it's like, man, you know, if your computer goes down, we can't tell Paramount that like, oh, sorry, Bob's computer went down in his apartment. So you guys don't get a campaign. So it's like back it up, you know. So 
were, were most of your team working locally and then uploading or did you have try any of the sort of remote login work? We, di we didn't do the remote login work because uh, a lot of our work now has been Octane and we had some weirdness with like yep. the GPU video cards and working remotely and I, it was a whole thing. So they work locally, but what we do is we back up uh, end of day every day and then my server here is backing up like every hour or so. Yeah, for Skywalker, uh, ahead, it was slightly, uh, slightly different. Um, thankfully, because you know it's such a tight knit group and it's not as massive as some other of these uh, studios and places. Uh, people were allowed to take their work systems home. <laughs> that includes uh, IMAX uh, speakers, mini mixers for headphone feeds, um, and then there's a special drive that uh, Skywalker came up with, which was kind of a sinking drive. It would sink to Skywalker's main, um, you know, storage. And um, you can log in to your computer normally, but it's if that drive is the main talk back and forth with Skywalker. And it was funny because, you know, a long time ago, I remember um, before the pandemic, the studio would never, ever allow any video to go anywhere other than to the facility that's working on the show. And all of a sudden, that went through, that went through the window. Everybody had picture at home, and you know all this stuff. I mean, with with the uh, encrypted drive, and you know, going back and forth, that was something. But still, I mean, you know that 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 was something that was really different. And but we had to do it to get it done. Um, did anybody have any issues with um, you, you know sort of at home internet connections where where people just didn't have the bandwidth in order to do their to do what oh, yeah. they're normally expecting? Yeah, there are a lot of people, it's funny, a lot of people did not have like the higher bandwidth internet. They would just, you know, get the basic or whatever. And then they quickly realized that this drive that's constantly syncing and talking to Skywalker is taking up a lot of bandwidth. So they actually had to upgrade. And um, then the question comes like, well, does the studio or the company help you pay for the upgrade? And as long as you're still working at home, do they help you with some kind of stipend or whatever? You know, so all that happened, all those questions happened. Um, the IT department at Skywalker Sound was unbelievable with the, uh, because that's the other thing is you don't really think about that when you're at work and you're, you know, you got something with your computer, you just slack someone, they come in, they're like, here you go, boom, boom, and they fix it and they walk away and you're working again. When you're at home and everyone's at home, you know, and there's only like four or five guys, it was a struggle for them, but they pulled it off. I mean, and in my, in my small business, we don't have the luxury or the, the finances that you guys have and, and the departments that you guys have. So when something goes down, I mean, that's part of, I, I'm like, all right, well, we got to find a way to meet the deadline guys. What are we going to do? You know, it's like, all right, are we, are you, are you currying a drive over to me? If your internet's down, then I need that drive ASAP rush and, and just, you know, land the plane. You got to get the plane on the ground. <laughs> do you have, do, how do you deal with it? I have, I have uh, this guy that he is, uh, has a team of like five or six guys that work for him and he's okay. my IT guy. So when <laughs> something happened and luckily one of them lives like three blocks from me. So oh, like when anything goes down, that guy just walks over. So, nice. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. So, you know, even with all the advancements of our technology, it sounds like sneaker net is still a, oh, yeah. uh, a viable option of if you have to <laughs> hand deliver a drive to get your oh, files, yeah. that's what you do. Definitely. For sure. Um, we had a, a question here, just kind of going back to um, setting up your space and your workstation, you know, when you're working at home is just um, suggestions for, you know, how to stay focused on a task. Um, what are some tips? This is from Ernesto Gomez. Uh, what are some tips to optimize your environment to stay focused and not distracted when you're, if you are having to work at home? I think, I think first off is making sure that you know what the mission is and what the win is in the eyes of your supervisor, whoever you're interacting with or your client, whoever it may be, making sure that what you're focused on is really, you know, like the key to getting focused is having a plan of what you're focused on to me. So like every day I try to kick off my guys with really clear goal for the day. And it's like, Hey, I set an expectation. I'd like to buy lunchtime, see this from you so that by this point in time, we can decide if end of day, we're going to be good to have this. 
So now that, that person's day is split up with micro goals and a, and a goal where they'll know by the end of the week, I'm aiming for this. And I do that because I like my company to operate hyper efficiently. I hate wastefulness in the creative process. And so many studios I worked for, they would waste so much money per day because people would be focused on things that didn't really matter or the communication would be so blurry. So when I started my small business, I really wanted, I, I wanted to be the opposite of that. Like we joke about network inefficiencies when a big television network has their, you know, 500 people interacting with something and, and the inefficiencies start to multiply. And my team and I joke a lot about how we want to be like the little hummingbird or speedboat that's saving them and bringing them clarity and not operating that way. So we pride ourselves in that. So a lot of it comes down to defining the expectation, understanding it, and then making sure that you're holding yourself accountable. I mean, there's a million tips about like, well, make your space this, or you know, pull your, your gaming shortcuts off your desktop so you're not noticing those or whatever. But all that stuff doesn't really matter. What matters is like, all right, what's the task at hand? And then how do I have, you know, and then go do it. There's not, you know, anything else to that. And uh, you could even um, add that, that, you know, there's a d difference between working remotely with a team versus a sort of a one-off freelance job where you have a deadline and you might have two or three days, right? If you're working remotely, you're expected, it's, 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 it's like hourly almost, where you're expected to be on during a set amount of time and to be accessible. So it's not, you can't, well, you know, they don't know I'm going out to lunch, so I'll just go have a long lunch. You're, you're going to be expected to have some type of schedule. Would and, you? And it's going to be unfair sometimes too. It's going to be it's going to be unfair sometimes. Like you're gonna, it's going to be like, oh man, well I was sorry I missed you. I was in the restroom and then I did take my lunch and then on the way back I actually had a phone call and I had to do this and, and it's it's going to be you know there's growing pains for clients, for managers, for artists, for seasoned people, for new people on all fronts and people are still learning how to interact in this new time. So the best way to navigate these waters, it's always good as a new hire, even not in these times, but is extremely blunt, clear communication as if you were going to land an airplane. Literally, it's like, okay, I'm going to put the wheels down. I'm going to start going, I'm going to start going down in height. And now I'm going to put the plane on the ground. That's my plan for the day. Does that sound good? Would you like me to check in with you more frequently today? Because if I don't, if, if not, here's my plan. Mm -hmm. And when you're proactive like that, when you do what, like, like if you as a new hire articulate that to your uh, supervisor or whoever you're reporting to, you almost do the job that I do for my guys that work for me. And you hand it back. You're like, my game plan for today is, you know, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. If you'd like more check-ins, let me know. And I'll, I'll send you updates along the way. Otherwise, I'm reachable anytime by cell or this or this or this. An email like that, just clarifying what your focus is, separates you from the competition. And I think that that we have a couple other questions here that 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 kind of also hit in here is, um, you know, uh, it sounds to me like you're, you're having to do less time tracking with your team because you're tracking communication versus, hey, we want you to clock in and register what you're working on, on any given project. But are, are there any tools that you're using regarding sort of tracking whose time is on which projects? I just keep track of what people work on per day with, you know, actuals and with my bookkeeper and things like mm -hmm. that. So, uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't have like a tool where it's like, click this button. If you're working on this project now, I think, you know, we, we know what the goal is for the day and we yeah. just, yeah. We, we get focused on that. Yeah. The honor system still holds up on like, you know, you confide in your employees to get the job done. You know, you can't hide if you're not getting it done at a small company, you can hide at a big company for a while, but it's not <laughs> worth it anyway. Well just, well just, you know, get the job done and, and be reliable. I mean, that's like the most important thing in our business. When you sell creativity, it's like being reliable and being a good communicator. And you don't have to be the best artist in the world. You don't have to change the world with your art. You don't have to figure it all out yourself. Being a good team player and being reliable and communicating and like pitching in and getting the job done, just stuff like that, you already separate yourself from so many people, you know? A, a, a simple suggestion even, especially when you're first starting, um, is if you find yourself with nothing to do, 
don't sit on your hands, tell your team you don't have anything to do. So yeah. that way they don't find out halfway through the day that, oh, you were never assigned a task or, or you finished early, right? Yeah. That, or that mindset, I, I, when I see that mindset in people, I know that they're not going to be a long-term person that I work with. Like I may not fire, if I book somebody, I'm not going to fire them if they have that mindset. But I just know when I start seeing it week after week, and it's not a fluke, it's just their, their nature, but I know that they're never going to get booked again. And they're just removed from my freelance mm -hmm. database. You know, I need people that are self-starters that are ready to work that always know there's something else to do that always can find a way to, to, you know, participate and add value. Yeah. And, and oh, offer help, offer help to help. someone yeah. else. Like, you know, like, yeah. Hey, I, I finished this thing. You need help with anything? You know, absolutely. That goes a long way. Absolutely. Uh, um, Eduardo asks, and we can kind of talk about um, this continues the sort of how do you manage from home is um, when you're working lots of hours, when when do you get, decide to take time off? How do you decide when to end your workday when you're already home? Well, I don't know. There's a lot of schools of thought on this, but I think when you're paying your dues and when you're first getting started, what really matters is nailing the expectation. And I, at least in my in my world, it's like, all right, we got to make a hot set of boards for this new foot joy commercial. It's like, okay, well, that's a big client. It's a big opportunity. We need to nail the boards. So we need to make it look sick. When I first got started working and it's a different time, but like, you know, my first booking at Logan, we were doing like a Madonna music video and I worked till like three 30 in the morning every night. And it was like, they didn't pay overtime. I would get in five minutes late the next day. And the guy would yell at me for being in five minutes late. And look, I don't run my studio like that. I don't want to have a sweatshop. I don't want to, you know, have poor quality of life for my people. We don't, we don't even really work late, hardly ever. But in the beginning, I always find like a lot of, on a lot of full sale panels, kids are like, how do I get work-life balance? And it's like, let's just get work first. Like, you don't, you know, I, you don't, I, I don't know, this isn't true, but I, it's funny and it's kind of true. It's like, you don't need work-life balance yet. You need work. You know, you already, <laughs> so it's like, like nail, nail your craft and get really good at it. And then when you need to step away, when you need to recharge your batteries, obviously honor that. It's easy for work to just spill into your entire night if you work from home. So at some point you got to set a boundary. You have to have your home time. You have to be able to recharge or else your creativity and your, your output will suffer for sure. But don't be afraid to work hard and a little late when you're first getting started. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, in, in my in my job, it's a little different. We are um, we're on the clock. Anytime that stage is rolling, we're on the clock. And if we need to go late, that's a decision that that requires a lot of upper management and and money and approvals and stuff like that. But that doesn't stop them. We work till you know ten thirty. We'll take a thirty minute dinner break. Go back to work. Uh, we'll work Saturdays. We'll work Sundays. We work all the time. And um, so my work-life balance is really dependent on the project, especially towards the end of the project, it gets intense. And it's like, you're working 13, 14 hour days, you go home, you, you go to sleep, you wake up, you go back to the studio and you just keep going, uh, working seven days a week. Um, and then it all stops. Once the project is done, it all stops. And um, let's say I don't have another project scheduled for another couple of weeks. That's my balance. That and it, I know it's not it's not similar to a lot of people's work life, but um, that's the way I've been doing it for so long now. And it helps to have a week or two off. And that's when when I'm off, it's family time. We're going here. We're going to go over there. We're going to hang out together. We're going to dinner. We're going to go on a quick getaway or something. But um, when when you're working, it's like you know, you're in it and you just have to be super focused on what you're doing to get the job done. Um, so unfortunately I don't, you know, working from home and doing that because I, I, I'm not in that, like that kind of group. Um, I, I think that, you know, you should, you should police yourself a little bit. I mean, you should be like, you know, don't work till 10 every night. If you're not getting paid to work till 10 every night, yeah. you know, one night you, you get, take it off and go have dinner with your, your wife or, you know, whatever, you know, you gotta, it's, it's super important to have this work-life balance. So, you know, you gotta. Yeah. 
And it's and, and one thing that's really true to it, and this is a weird gray area because there's truths on both sides of the coin here and balance is such an important thing. When you're new to, if you're working every night so late and you're making it obvious, but your work still isn't there yet, you're actually damaging your own brand a little bit. And in, in, in a way you can like make it feel like, geez, this person is continuing to demonstrate that they're not like ready to produce or they have to jam till two in the morning just to get the bare minimum done. So it's, it's a weird, it's a weird balance there. Like you want to show that you're not afraid to work late, that you're not going to be difficult, that you, you don't mind staying in the trenches, but you also don't want to make yourself like seem like, gosh, this kid just to hang on as you know, he's going to burn himself out. Like he's not ready here or something. So it, it is a weird gray area there. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, talking a little a little bit deeper about the sort of the technical end of managing a creative team. Um, one question, and I'll kind of combine these together. One question kind of talks about um, during this time, did you find your management style having to switch more to uh, time management or task management and the tracking of those tasks? And if you did, are there, are there um, tools that you utilize that help you track your team? Um, and an, another person kind of says, um, can they address the pros and cons of these third-party tools like Loom or Slack versus sort of native sharing inside the applications or inside of your, your data store? Sort of a strange combination there. Yeah, for, for me, I, I think that clarity of what people are doing and what they're working on and clarity about subjective things that we don't have figured out yet that's that's like for right now, like so right now, the guys who made nailed it on Netflix, we're doing a new show with them. And they got on the phone with us the other day. We're on the phone with the, the creators and nailed it and the producer and all these people on Netflix. And they're saying, like, yeah, we want the show to feel like sciencey, but not like scientific and retro, but not like too old. And we don't want it to be slick, but it has to be professional. And so, you know, like stuff like that. Anyway. You know, we want to give you the job, but like, can you get us a mood board in a couple of days? Can you pitch on it for free to make sure that you're right for it? So we're sitting around and now we've just been on a call with all these important people that get to say all this stuff. And if you really wrote down every word everyone said, we have no real information from them. And everything they said was a contradiction and everything was off. So then it's like, okay, we know we need to impress all these people with images. And we know we need to like make graphics for this Netflix show and scientific, but not too, and this and that, and all these guardrails and rules. So it's hard is all these tools like Loom and all this stuff, they're just tools. Like a tool is just a tool. It matters how you're using the tool and why you're using the tool. It doesn't matter if it's a pen, a Wacom tablet, Loom, software, email, Slack. What matters is what you're saying. And what matters even more than that is why you're saying it. So a lot of it comes down to creative, subjective, nuanced things. How are we going to make this client feel that we're the right person to do this job? What do we have to do? And so a lot of it will come down to like, okay, there was a lot of contradiction about this topic, this topic, and that topic. So those are key inflections in the design and how people react to the design. And they can, fodder, they can be fodder for conversation to make our pitch really focused. So today your focus is to explore styles that play with this and then tomorrow or next week we're going to do styles that play with that and then on the call with the client our goal is to compare and contrast them so it's not a conversation of should it be nate's company or a competitor's company i want the client to start feeling like should we use nate's direction a or direction c and and then we we already have won then you know so it comes down to like what you're doing with the tool why you're doing it and having a good game plan and and like being unified with your team about what you're getting done. I run a different type of business than a lot of businesses though. So that in my world, we're pitching a lot, you know? The um, kind of to shift just a little bit um, when we're talking about sort of text communication, whether it be through some messaging or email, um, I was curious, and this is a question I think every teacher asks at some point at every hall of fame session is the importance of, of sort of clear grammar and communication in a professional setting. Um, what 
sort of I'm curious what your sort of expectations are for that. How how do you handle how do you prefer like, you know, sort of slang or abbreviations or what type of, you know, what level of communication are you expecting of your creatives in, you know, especially now as you might be sending messages back and forth all day. I imagine it gets a little more informal. Informal. It's fine. Situational awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, if the client's on the email chain, you're not replying like all slanged out necessarily. Maybe sometimes you are, but if we're just popping back and forth and it's like round seven of design feedback, and it doesn't need to be like, dear Nate, I hope you are well. Please find goodbye smiles from now on. 18th century farmer is, is mailing. That would be you. nice, actually. I do. Uh, for me, it's, it's super different. I, um, when, when I'm mixing and I'm, we're trying to create stuff and there's a sound that comes up and it, it, it's not working for the story. Um, I, I tend to, in order to be as clear and as precise as possible, I tend to, it's very musical for me. So it's like, you know, I'm trying to go from one sound into another sound into another sound. So I'm making mouth noises. Um, <laughs> I'm coding other movies, uh, other, or, uh, other, you know, just other sound moments that happened some, you know, in an old movie, like for however long ago. And I remember this one scene and I'm like, you know what it should sound like? It should sound like this. So now we go to YouTube and we look it up and we play it and we listen to it and all that. So for us, it's super informal, but that's usually when the client's not there. When the client's there and I have to have these conversations, sometimes I, I walk over to, you know, pull to the side and I kind of try to be you know it's so funny that you say that you know the grammar and everything I, you have to be so precise when you're asking for a fix or a change of something because one misinterpretation and it's 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 gone completely the opposite way that you're expecting so yeah picking the right words and and keeping it short and sweet it'll win until the end of time for sure yeah. That's so true. It's amazing right. how true that is across such different disciplines, but we're, we're both, I mean, you're talking about a noise from some other movie and you're caring, you're, you're paying attention to that. There's nuance and why you want it to be connected to the story. And it's the same with us with some color choice or design yeah. decision and there's nuance to it and knowing when to expand on that or knowing when just to like capture the, the word or the way to say it with the least room for misinterpretation. Yeah, you know, or, exactly. or just knowing how your feedback's going to land with somebody and knowing where mm -hmm. there might be a pitfall in the way they would hear it. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be, you know, wrapping up soon here. And um, so one question I, that, that uh, popped up was the um, four graduates who are looking and pursuing work, um, you know, and they they have to be remote. Um, or the position is remote and they're trying to gain, you know, get hired as a remote worker. Um, are there any suggestions on how to present yourself as a remote worker, as a new, you know, somebody you don't know in the studio? Um, how do they make that a, a good impression, um, either through the interview process or how they communicate with you to start with? I, I think it's about just not, at, at that point, it's about, not giving anybody like a hard no with the way you're communicating. It's like your space, your internet connection, your camera, the light, your appearance, all those things matter. But they, it's not the necessarily the, the make or break. They're not the make part of it. They could be the break part of it. It's like, you're not gonna get hired if you dress nice on camera, but you might not get it if you dress like a slob. Or it's like, you know, if, you're, if your room is like, beer cans piled up behind you and stuff and it's like you know totally messy you're probably not going to get it so you're not going to necessarily in my mind you're not going to like land the job because you had a great zoom but it comes back down to what you're being hired for the communication the situational awareness of knowing what this company is looking for knowing that you are you know i always i always say to people like you could be really confident even though you don't have all the answers yet a lot of people are nervous in job interviews coming out of school because they're not there yet. They're not good enough yet. They're still learning. They're still developing. But instead of being nervous about that or trying to like hide it or something, 
you can be very confident in terms of where you're at in the truth of that moment. So you could say, you know, look, I'm hiring, I'm, I'm out of school. I want to join your team and continue to grow with you guys. And you could be confident in that position of not knowing all the answers. And I feel like being honest and not being a know-it-all, not being like, you have all the answers and your feet are up on the desk and you just graduated school just in time to save this company because you're the, the best artist in the world. It's like just walking in and being honest, like, hey, you know, I've just graduated. I'm super passionate about this stuff. Love your company. I know you're hiring for X, Y, Z. I want to grow with your team. I'm reliable. I'm a good communicator. I'm ready to work. And here's my portfolio. And, and it's good. I, you could see that I have effort in it. And being confident with where you are in that moment without crossing over to ego, just, just owning with where you're at and owning what you don't know too. I think that's a lot of ways that you can separate from other people these days. Yeah, I agree with that. Exactly. Um, you know, when someone's hiring, they know, they all know that you don't know yet. You know what I mean? So don't be afraid that you don't know the, all the answers that they're going to ask you. They know that, you know, and they're looking for someone and what they're looking for is someone who says, I want to learn. I really want to learn more. I love this. I want to, I want to, you know, do better. Um, I have been in the business over 20 years. I'm still learning stuff every day, still different things that are happening. And, and just every project is slightly different. So you do something, you're like, Oh, you know what? That actually works really well. I'm going to try that next time. You know, so you're constantly learning. And the other thing is to be honest with you in, in, in any industry, I believe, uh, you know, uh, Nate can, back me up or not but I would rather work with someone who is is a great um, collaborator open and really you know good attitude working then with someone who's really good at their job but they're not really good at communicating and they're not very you know fun to be around or whatever because the other thing is you know we spend a lot of time uh, especially in these these types of in this type of work any kind of creative work, you spend hours and a long, you almost spend more time with these people than you do with your own family. When, when you start adding up the amount of time you spend with the group that you're working with, you want to, you, somebody you get along with and you want somebody who, who, who can like bounce stuff off of or whatever. So I would rather do that. So if you go into an interview and you're just like, yeah, I can do this. I can do that. I can do, I know all this or that. You're just like, okay, here we go. You know, uh, but if you're, if you get into an interview and you're somebody like, yes, I really want to learn this. I love this, uh, this uh, program that you guys are using. I would love to like really know how to use that or whatever that gives the person hiring. It's like, oh, right. Well, here we go. A blank slate. Let's mold this person into be the best that they can be at doing this job. Yeah. That's how you're going to get the job. And, and one thing on that, that is so, you know, I agree completely with what you're saying there, Juan. And, and I think one, one, you know, like when people apply at my company, I get on Zoom and I talk to them, but it usually is not that way, right? You usually are dealing with much larger companies. You're dealing with some hiring person or HR person. Knowing when you're speaking to somebody who's really savvy and really is working in the business rather than some frontline hiring manager, there's a difference there. And this is generic what I'm saying. This isn't always true, but generically speaking, it's like to the frontline yes or no person that's filing you, I wouldn't necessarily be trying to own, oh, I don't know so much. I don't know. You know, like <laughs> that person, you want to get past that first gatekeeper, right? Then let's say you're talking to somebody that is in the business working every day, like Juan or me or whatever, right? That, that's where you can have strength in the vulnerability. Because when you're speaking to people that really know what they're doing and really are working in the business, they know that you don't know everything. But that frontline hiring manager person or HR person, their job is to make sure people that don't belong for their to their resume to swim upstream don't get there, right? So you don't want to you don't want to try and like confess your soul to that person that you're so new. So it's about situational awareness and about having targeted communication. It's about selling yourself the right way to the right people, knowing your audience. So all those again, like Zoom, remote, these are tools of the times that we have to have. But like, how can we use this tool to our advantage? That's what, that's what it is, the common theme in everything. Like I see a question, should I get a second monitor? It's a tool. What matters is selling your design, selling yourself, selling your whatever, selling your sound. You know, So it's like finding a way to connect with people. That's what matters. 
more than the tool or the way it's done necessarily. It's like, what is the end goal and how are we going to do it? Um, just a quick note to add to this. Like, you know, I know I, I have a feeling that the question was more geared like, um, how do I present myself over Zoom or over Google Meet or something like that? I mean, I would literally approach it as if you were going to go into their office, yeah. you know, get up, take a shower, brush your hair, put on oh. something nice, you know, set the camera up to where, you know, get a decent background. Okay. And now you talk, you know, don't like, like, like Nate said earlier with the beer cans and a mess behind you or whatever, yeah. you know, treat it. Yeah. If you're going, if you're going for a professional job, treat it professionally. Yeah. Or, or even, uh, uh, I wouldn't take the, those meetings on your phone in your car right. driving, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> like make it really look yeah. like you set your day aside for exactly. them. Exactly. Um, so that it's not like, oh, it just happened to be, you know, oh, I guess I'll take this meeting now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm kind of curious, um, uh, you know, somebody kind of asked about the uh, sort of age and hiring. And I, I was just kind of curious, Han, um, you know, with this move to remote, did, um, you know, employees that have been around or people you've worked with that have been around for a while, um, did you find it harder or easier to work with people who've been doing this for a while? Or were there some new people that came in and they're used to this workflow? And so, um, so having a younger employee suddenly became an ad advantageous because they understood um, this, these forms of communications. I'm just curious if you ran into any of that. I think, I think the age thing, it can be an advantage or a disadvantage. And it comes down to the way you present yourself. I have, no, there's no, nothing in my head that's like, it has to be a person under this age. That's not even a thought to me. Now, is it true that like a lot of people that do motion graphic stuff happen to be younger or now starting to become my age or a little older than me? Like, yes, because inherently the industry was kind of newer or born that way but it doesn't mean anything. I think, I think it comes down to like a way that for me, it's about selling and spinning anything. It's like you're older. All right. Well, maybe, you know, people are going to make an assumption that some of the tech stuff, maybe you're not as savvy with. Well, show them that that's not true. And, you know, it's been in a way where it's like, man, the perspective that I have and the, the, the vision that I have for this is mature and it cuts through the noise and it still can excite people. Like, you know, you could, you can make the argument if you're too young, maybe it's a disadvantage. If you're too old, maybe it's a disadvantage. And, and you can make that for a billion different things. So just find a way to spin it to be your advantage. And if you know that there might be some stereotype or preconceived notion, or even if you feel that that might be there, then make sure it's not there. You know, I had a guy, I had a guy the other day who um, wanted me to help him sell his company. Uh, he does holograms and stuff and all this stuff. And he's very old and his tech stuff was really bad. We couldn't even, I couldn't get an email to him because he has the spam filter and I have to register, but his site is down and then his website wasn't working. And, and every hurdle of just trying to communicate with this guy was so dated and I couldn't even, there was no, we couldn't have communication. So he checked all these boxes of like, gosh, this old guy who knows some hologram technology that's cool. He just, he just, I can't communicate with him. He's not a reliable person. I can't do business with him. Now it happened to be true. He was older and he was not savvy with tech, but like, like it doesn't have to be that way. I would have gladly worked with this guy, you know? So there's, to me, there's no age, race, sex, color, whatever, like anything that would make me care. It's about the creative. It, you know what I mean? It's about good, create, good creative and good communication. The, yeah, um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, go ahead. Oh, no, I agree with that completely. I mean, I have, uh, sound effects editors who are young who are killing it and then I have older ones who have so much experience and they are amazing as well so age is just a number to be honest and it's really about what you're producing mm -hmm. yeah and I, I would be miss remiss to not um, uh, share this the career development team um, often they're always stressing trying to uh, convince our our students and graduates is um, when you're on the job hunt, and particularly when you're hunting remotely, you have to check your email all the time. Don't ignore that. Often that's where those those uh, um, positions are going to be offered officially through email. And let's just say it's it's been something that we've struggled with recently is convincing people to to keep up with that that line of communication so it's 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 still away it's 30 40 years old 50 years old now but it's uh it's not going away yeah 
Um, so, um, so here we are. Let's go and wrap up here. Uh, you know, any last sort of thoughts regarding the world of the creative world and the remote world and where you might think it's going um, as we as we start back up or have been starting up um, with the pandemic. Well, I think it's I think it's gonna some things are gonna stick. I definitely think that that remote collaboration is going to stick yeah. in in any situation where for example you can't fly or you can't do this that is definitely going to happen we've proven that it works very well uh there are a lot of tools that have come out of the necessity of having to do this remotely that are working and they're continually to work on um so you know i would that remote work and the remote lifestyle i don't think is going to go away especially because we're working with people all around the world all the time and 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 that has always been the case right we've always worked with people from all over the place um but now with all this video chatting and all this uh, remote collaboration i think it's just going to continue to go i would treat it as professionally as possible don't um don't do the phone thing try to get a laptop you know if there's a meeting get there on time don't be late because you were doing something just because if you were at work you'd be doing the same thing right? You would be, oh, I got to go to this meeting. Here I am. I'm going to walk down the hall. I'm going to be there. You know, you want to get there early. Um, and oh, I forgot what I was going to say the next last thing, but uh, <laughs> yeah, basically it's not going away. Oh yes. The replying to the emails and the replying to the, to the Slack messages and Discord, whatever it is to, to be prompt on a response is just going to elevate you as a worker to your supervisors no matter what it is even if you're going into work every day and someone sends you an email a prompt response to an email is like and and nate can attest to this as a supervisor yeah that's what you want you want to send an email and then you're like waiting (laughs) forever to get a response and you get that response within like two or three minutes you're like oh great thank you so much you know it actually is a big is a big deal so, that's, that's true. Awesome. That is true. All up every cycle of this too, from your first job to the, me, the way like tonight we're delivering some stuff for a new top chef and the showrunner on it. I know if I didn't reach out to them, I would have an email in my inbox like, hey, are we still on track tonight to get these files from you? And I don't want the client to have to think that. So I wrote them early this morning and I said, subject line, top chef, you know, the show acronym they have for it. I wrote like basically top chef on posting on track and it said hi client we are on track for a posting tonight as planned blah 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 you know best name short sweet and they get it they already can they already understand it from the subject line that's the other thing is the the being blunt and clear with your emails and with your communication i mean sometimes i i ask a question on an email and a new artist will write me back like you know seven paragraphs and i'm just like oh god i just like, I'm just trying to ask, are we on track for tonight? Like, uh, I don't want to, you know, so getting to the point really quickly, I think is a good thing. That's, that's a good thing in sales and communication for anything. In your new job, a lot of people just talk about a billion things. It's like, do you, did you tell them you really want to work there? Like, sometimes just being simple like that. Like, so why are you here? And it's like, because I really would love to work with you guys. Like, what you guys do is unbelievable. And I want to be a part of this team. It's like, whoa. How many, did 99% of the other people that came and try to get this job, did they ever say anything that blunt to the person and that clear? And uh, that's what I try and train the people that work for me to, the way they speak to me to be is I, I want them to just tell me what's up. Tell me what, why are we having the meeting? Tell me, start there. And then we can dive in deeper. Don't dive in deep and then all lead up to some big point that you're trying to get to. Start with the point and then let's, let's dive in deeper if we need to. All right. So uh, I think we will wrap up this session now. Uh, Nathaniel and Juan, thank you so very much for your time. Students, uh, whatever digital form of clapping or waving at the screen, feel free to uh, to show your appreciation. And um, and students, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, we, we know you're busy and we know the type of work you have to go through. So uh, thank you for taking a moment and uh, spending it with us. Cool. Thank you guys. Good to see Pleasure. you. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you too, mate.